My name is Mark Furs and I'd like to welcome you to this debrief session from uh, the, the first symposium jointly held by EASL and the ASLD on alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis. And I'm joined today around the table by my conference co-organizers, so Philippe Mathurin, John Gijabo and Vijay Shah, uh, and representing both of the professional associations. And this has been a brilliant experience for all of us. It's the first time that we've sat around as a group of academics, uh, clinical experts. We have regulatory agencies and industry contributing to two days uh, of workshops, discussions, lectures uh, on um, these really critical importance of alcoholic liver disease uh, and alcoholic hepatitis, which as you all know, and the main causes of mortality from liver disease in the, the Western world. The goals of this uh, conference were to identify consensus uh, amongst the experts in alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis, but more importantly to identify controversial areas and uh, define future directions, unmet needs that I think were really fantastically um, accomplished during this meeting. Well, uh, I think uh, what became clear from the meeting was that although a lot of resources and funding uh, goes to a number of causes of liver disease, alcoholic liver disease is really the driver of uh, a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality related to liver disease. So it was fantastic to see uh, this much attention uh, on this agenda. And personally, I felt, especially the interactions with the industry, this was a really brilliant part of the meeting to uh, facilitate this process uh, because we know that we need our industry partners to really drive progress for new treatments uh, for these patients. And uh, in addition, so what I think it was very interesting is that uh, for the first time we have those, uh, even the, and the specialist in transactional and animal model tried mm -hmm. to, to understand clearly what we are looking for, what we need. And in addition, also the physician tried to converge on some endpoints on how we are looking at drug efficacy, how we are looking at drug development. As you mentioned just before the VJ, the fact that the health agency and the industry are there, mm -hmm. that will help them out mm -hmm. to define what will be the best strategy and also what will be the plan of development, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And I do think that we make major, major progress with regard to this issue. So one of the issues that constantly worries me in, in this field is the lack of investment. Um, I feel a little bit jealous that you have in the United States, the NIAAA, who have actually, as it were, seen the light. They've invested in research in alcoholic liver disease. In Europe, we have no equivalent. There's no uh, specific calls on alcoholic liver disease from the European Commission, from the uh, MRC, uh, Medical Research Council in the UK, or the NIHR. Uh, and actually, you know, we spent a lot of the time over the, this weekend discussing the research needs, and they still remain huge. And in contrast to hepatitis C, to NASH, uh, I think we, you know, in the field of alcoholic liver disease, we're well behind. So I think investigators in the U.S. Re mm. definitely recognize that the support of the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse that uh, committed uh, earmarked dollars for alcoholic liver disease about five years ago is, is really paying off because the, and I think that goes across the, the globe. Mm. And I think this is the first sort of step to come and come together with the experts from Europe because you know mo all of you contributed a lot with clinical trials and, and, and many of the basic science components also come and, and now new clinical trials come from the U.S. that I think uh, really energizes this field. And um, new clinical trials that are kind of in, in, in pilot studies mm -hmm. and, and really new initiatives are coming out from the NIAAA supported clinical trials that, mm -hmm. that will inform the field. Yeah. One, one of the fun things I, I found from the meeting was that uh, there's dramatically different approaches and ideas on either side of the Atlantic. Um, an example is liver biopsy and um, uh, we, we, what's fun is though when we get together we're able to talk through things and it's remarkable uh, how meetings like this are able to help us uh, generate consensus even on uh, issues which uh, seem black and white to each of us. 
uh, and we start to see what really is the right path uh, to move the world forward in combating this disease. And in addition, which is inter very interesting, that the fact there is a stigma. There is a stigma, in f in, I would say, in Europe with regard to how you support research, as mentioned by, by Mark just before. And there is a stigma for access to therapy, which is not the case in Europe, but it's the case in the United States. And therefore, when you combine this together, and you, as you mentioned, we can get the help from the United States because they put a much effort in the translational data that we did not have so far. Mm -hmm. Conversely, what we learned for our clinical practice, the fact that most of our patients are accessing to therapy and therefore we can test drugs even if we agree that they are not working so well. But we, I do think that those kind of common conferences uh, help also to identify where are the problem and how we can make it up in order to improve for you guys access for, tr for therapy, meaning that the patient may come in, mm -hmm. may uh, be a candidate for future therapy, and therefore that will also solve the problem of liver biopsy and other things that mm -hmm. is uh, related to practice. So this concept about stigmatization, it came up several times, and it, you, it's good that you highlight it actually, Philippe, because uh, there is a perception, don't you think, that uh, actually in drug companies, in hospitals, uh, general practice, that, that people have this attitude, oh, well, if they would just give up drinking, there wouldn't be a problem. And somehow, uh, alcohol is different than other addictions, you know. So people who smoke will still get treatment for emphysema, for lung cancer, people who eat too much, they'll still get treatment and investment in research on their diabetes, even now that they're, they're NASH. But alcohol is just, for some reason, it's separated out. Uh, and I don't understand it, and it's clearly there in the research agencies, among some of our clinical colleagues, our academic colleagues, and even in industry. So I think one of the lessons that I'm going home with after this conference that I think resonated both from basic scientists, agencies, industry, and, and providers, that indeed we have a lot to do in terms of advocacy for this patient population. No, everyone agreed on how this is a neglected patient population with a disease that hasn't moved anywhere in treatment in, what, 30-something years. We, we, we've seen results that, that were similar the, the described in 1966 mm -hmm. compared to where we are now mm -hmm. in clinical outcomes, which is stunning because there are really not too many other diseases where medicine really hasn't made that much improvement. So uh, everyone agrees on that, yet we have to deal with this uh, kind of societal stigma that, that uh, sort of penetrates not only at the level of society, but almost like the patients are not aware that potentially new clinical trials are available or going to be available. The families are not aware of that. And that I think is a major difference compared to many other liver diseases where we historically, NASH or hepatitis C, where, where advocacy groups for patients mm -hmm. know that, that uh, all of these efforts are going on. So that, that, one, that is one area. And then as you mentioned, we probably even have to get to educate our own colleagues in, in gastroenterology or even on, on, the, on the current hepatology team to buy into the concept that indeed mm -hmm. this is an area that's ripe for changes and changes only can be made by us, the sort of um, advocacies and leaders in the field, yeah. Yeah. I would say. So maybe on a more positive note for, for you know, the, the conference over the weekend covered everything from epidemiology to uh, public he health measures to basic science, including genetics, immunology, to the clinical trials. The whole, you know, everything was covered and I, I, I kind of felt slightly uplifted that you know, actually we know quite a lot more mm -hmm. about the biology of the disease uh, and for those who are interested, you know, the, many of the lectures will be on the mm -hmm. liver tree and they'll be available to, to look at um, after the conference. Uh, and indeed, there are a number of both therapeutic targets and potential drugs, uh, but actually we need to drive those forward now into mm -hmm. clinical trials, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And on a personal note, I want to thank Mark uh, for um, having the meeting in London it was a wonderful city to have this meeting and it's also appropriate because uh, the trial that Mark ran in the UK was the largest uh, study ever conducted uh, in this condition and really uh, I think uh, was appropriate to have the meeting here.
So maybe is Philippe is thinking, well, <laughs> what about his study? No, 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 so no, we'll no, do no. the next one in Paris. In Lille, or in Lille. No, 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 no. But the thing that was interesting, that was a very striking fact, is that when you look at the epidemiological expert mm -hmm. who, was, who was there, Dave and, and, uh, and Dr. Hem, what they raise the point is that we need to bridge, to build up the bridge for for life, you know what I mean? This is why we need to bring this concept. Those guys, in order to have a long life, we need to give, give them the bridge because they are at risk of short-term, medium-term mortality, and this is our job. And then after that, they are, because I, I said, as mentioned by, by Mark, it's, we need to think that we, we always talking in alcoholic liver disease about primary intervention. But we never talk about secondary or tertiary intervention, which is the case in the diabetes, because those guys are already on the road of death. If you don't doing anything, they're gonna die, because primary intervention will decrease mortality 10 years, 20 years later on, etc. So the person who are dying right now in our beds, we need to consider them. And this is very interesting that this, it was striking that most of the epidemiological guy push us to have those type of pure study to test drug with probably in phase one or phase two, in phase two, uh, liver biopsy, and then in phase three, as we mentioned, probably get rid of and have non-invasive method, but nevertheless, what is striking is that the fact that they told us that it's very necessary in that we act like in diabetics to, 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 uh, to build up this bridge of life, I would say. Yeah, I, I, th I think it was, it was interesting to hear that, you know, this alcoholic liver disease and spectrum of the d disease sort of uh, poses many questions uh, and, and, and highlights the importance of, of intervention. So in the acute alcoholic hepatitis patients, the very severe form of alcoholic liver disease, we recognize that the survival is, is 30% or, or less, that you can think about it in a way that some of the metastatic cancers have better survival than this mm -hmm. disease. And then in the discussions, at the same time, it came up that you know, we don't want to just focus on this, this very, very sick patient population. We also have to think and, 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 and recognize the chronicity of alcoholic liver disease that really is not very well defined because many of the patients who may be walking with, uh, with low level of alcoholic hepatitis may not even be uh, diagnosed. And, and how are we going to engage those patients and how are we going to engage our our provider colleagues to actually recognize that disease is an opportunity. And, uh, and the evolution of medicine kind of comes in here because if you were a cardiologist or even if you're looking at NASH, it's very well recognized now that, that we need to look at the chronicity of the disease and try to intervene kind of early on. That is a concept that, that is, I think, just being introduced for alcoholic liver disease. Um, and, and it's exciting that it came out from this meeting. There are things that are, are, are improving really in the care of patients with alcoholic hepatitis. And I, I really wanted to draw attention to the, the debate around transplantation. Mm -hmm. And it, I found it quite amusing. It was quite difficult in, in a, okay, a debate, of course, is a slightly artificial construct, but we had to have somebody who was arguing against transplantation. And clearly, you know, Mike Lucy, really well informed, had a lot of difficulty, I think you'd agree, <laughs> in arguing against it. Uh, and, you know, big congratulations to Philippe. Uh, you know, you, you established this as, as a treatment, and we all know it's not a treatment for everybody with alcoholic hepatitis, but it, it, it's there, it's established. The, there's very little resistance to transplantation in, in, in the major transplant centers. I think there is still a huge amount of resistance among some of our colleagues in gastroenterology, internal medicine, who are not referring the patients. I agree. No, no, this is a, I think this type of, of meeting will decrease the stigma and will, in, will in, I would say, involve more and more GP in this field. Why? Because I do think that more you would say that there is, I would not say, smart people, but I would say people who are deeply involved in it. Mm. People are working accurately in order to to find out and to base their pro, pro, uh, all the therapeutic proposition according to data, not to be belief. On, uh, with this type of step-by-step -step approach, I would do think it will change. And this is why probably the early liver transplantation works, because it works because it was a collective effort. Mm. Psychiatrist was there, a specialist of liver transplantation according to organ shortage was raising the point in order not to affect the waiting list, which is another important issue. So again, this is why this conference is uh, striking for me, it was striking me, is that the fact that we are working on data. 
we have some, I would say, some discrepancy, but those discrepancies are on data, and this is a new, new, new aspect in this field, which is very important. So it was interesting to hear that, and, and really positive, I think, that, that to have the regulatory agencies, mm -hmm. EME and FDA representatives here, and, and hearing how they are open to work with, uh, with clinicians in identifying uh, better ways to guide clinical trials with respect to identifying mm -hmm. surrogate markers, and, and we heard a lot about uh, strategies for biomarker discoveries that certainly can move this field forward, and some of the presentations mm -hmm. that, that uh, you provided mm -hmm. on biomarkers mm -hmm. and you know, the, the field, I think, is more, more mm -hmm. certainly moving that way. Well, on, on behalf of all of us, uh, we hope you enjoy uh, some of the content that's available for you and we hope you enjoyed our, our discussion as well. And I think finally we want to just thank again Easel for hosting us and ASLD for uh, embarking on this joint venture that we hope that is going to energize the field and continue. And I do think it will. And we should hopefully be repeating this in a couple of years' time.